Good afternoon to those folks located on the East Coast and good morning to everyone else. My name is Dave Pont. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of the ABA Forum on Construction Law Division I Toolbox Talk Series. Uh, this series has been ongoing since I believe 2021. Um, we're going to continue it into 2023 as we move forward. Um, these are talks, uh, or just that. It's a discussion on various topics with people who know a lot about those topics. So please feel free. In fact, I encourage you to join in the conversation. Um, today's discussion is on design build standard of care with Than Doe and Joel Hurd. Um, also, I'd like to, to note that Joel heads up Division Four, so we would like to uh, welcome any of the Division Four members uh, to today's discussion. Um, Dr. Thando is a structural engineer and failure investigator with Thornton Tomasetti. He's assisted attorneys, general contractors, and design professionals with construction claims analysis and dispute resolution. His specialties include cause and origin investigation of construction and or design defects, standard of care evaluation, and code compliance assessment regarding design build. Thon has played different roles over the years, serving as a structural engineer on new building design projects, as well as conducting forensic investigations on several large infrastructure projects. Joel Hurd is a partner with Osler's Construction and Infrastructure Practice Group. He's based in Toronto, Ontario. He has extensive experience advising on domestic and international projects of all sizes and across a variety of industries, including energy, electrical power generation and transmission projects, pipeline construction, infrastructure, mining, manufacture, transportation, education, and health healthcare. Joel has assisted project participants with respect to such matters as risk identification, allocation, and mitigation, project structuring, and teaming arrangements, including traditional design build, EPC, and construction management, uh, P3 projects, as well as alternative financing procurements, joint ventures, consortia, and subcontracts. Procurement, contract negotiation and documentation, project execution, claims analysis, and avoidance. Joel is also an active participant in the ABA Forum on Construction Law, and as mentioned, is currently the chair of Division 4, which is a project delivery and construction technology. So gentlemen, at first I'd like to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. And my first question is this, how to define standard of care in a design build environment? And does it vary from the proposal phase to the contract phase? Okay, <clears throat> um, Joe, may I, uh, maybe I, I can start with this one and then uh, we can switch next time. Go right ahead. Tom. So, so just just a minute before we we get to the the details here. Just want to you know say something so we're on the same page. So the intention of this discussion is not you know to compile a to do list of you know um, proposed solutions to issues that may arise on design build projects. And the intention here is to you know start a conversation around the topic to raise awareness uh, uh, and bring it to the attention of the legal design and construction community. Uh, and we only have 30 minutes, so I'm happy to have follow-up discussions with you. We have a run out of time. So Dave and Tom, if you can circulate our contacts afterwards, uh, that'd be great. Um, so back to your question, standard of care. Um, you know, uh, I think standard of care is, is usually uh, defined, um, you know, in uh, timmy agreements, contracts, and the, the language varies from project to projects, but essentially standard of care requires a party to exercise the skill, care, and diligence reasonably expected of a member in the same profession performing the same services in the same area at the same time. Um, arguably, you know, the standard of care definition still holds regardless of, you know, whether it is, um, you know, proposal phase or final design phase and regardless of project, project delivery methods. But we have to be careful uh, and be aware of the circumstances and the nuance for a particular um, phase or particular um, project delivery methods. So, you know, design builds versus design bit builds, there are some nuance of design builds that, you know, you, there are some certain standard of care that is applicable to design build, but may not be for design bit builds. 
And same thing for you know proposal phase versus final design because of the different circumstances. Um, yeah, so for example, you know, in level in, of involvement of designer in preparing the, the bit, um, that's the distinction between design bit build and design build. And also proposal phase, you know, um, it is not uncommon that there are limitations in time, compensation, and information during proposal phase. So it may be, it, it may be difficult to expect, um, you know, the preliminary drawings would show every single typical detail and complete set of uh, uh, construction uh, drawings like in the final phase. But at the same time, there's some certain bar and expectation that you need to hit uh, for your preliminary drawings. And uh, again, it depends on different projects and you have to, um, you know, every, all the parties have to be at the same, on the same page with regard to, you know, what are reasonable and what are required for a particular project. Yeah, and and um, you know, there's there's a lot of different nuances there. I think to to unpack. I think one thing I should let everyone know is that I'm not a litigator, even though uh, I sit next to one in my office. And my focus for the better part of the last thirty years has been trying to proactively address risk uh, at the front end of projects through um, you know careful identification and allocation of risks through um, you know, through the procurement stage, through contract uh, documentation. And one thing that's that's been, and, and I've had experience both at large firms and at is, as an in-house counsel at a global engineering and construction company. And one thing that's always uh, been front and center is that there's the typical tort law standard of uh, of care with respect to a professional designer. And then there's what's uh, in that uh, party's contract. And sometimes they can be uh, have a great deal of difference between that, uh, both in terms of standard of care. You can see the standard of care in some contracts be drafted in such a way that it's elevated above what the typical tort law or common law standard, if applicable, might be. Um, and uh, you know, so that you can see it defined with things like, you know, uh, state of the art or best in class, uh, you know, leading engineering or architectural design firms and things like that, as opposed to uh, what Tant was saying uh, really about, um, is it with respect to the ordinary standard standard of care that you would typically find for um, uh, consultants with appropriate skill and qualifications on projects? Of a similar type, in this in a similar in a similar area. So that's one where, way you can find sometimes the contractual standard can differ. But in a lot of times, when you get into design build agreements, especially uh, the uh, the liability associated with failing to meet the appropriate standard can be changed. Um, and you can get into things like warranties, uh, things like fit for purpose warranties or um, uh, uh, you know, uh, things like performance guarantees. Sometimes when you find, when you're in a, um, a, 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 a EPC contract, and sometimes you can even get warranties that talk about the, you know, the work, which would include both the design and construction as being free from defects. So there's a number of different things that you would have to look at. And then I think, so that's looking at, the standard of care at the head contract, the design build contract between the design builder and the owner. Then you also have the issue of how do you, um, what is the standard of care as you proceed, as, as Tom quite uh, uh, rightly mentioned, as you proceed from the bid phase through to actually performing the final design? Because in a typical traditional design bid build type of project, the owner would bear the risk of schedule and cost delays arising from issues coming up as the design progresses from uh, early phases through to the final design. Whereas in a design build uh, project, um, the uh, contract, the design build contract is entered into 
well before a final design has been, typically well before the final design has been developed. And so then who as between the design builder and whoever the uh, design consultant is, who the design builder um, effectively subcontracts its um, design obligations to bears the risk of those sorts of things. So you have the owner issues on one, one level, but then also because typically design build projects are bid on a fixed price basis, um, uh, who bears the risk for additional costs and scheduled delay that the constructor may encounter as a result of changes to the design or unforeseen conditions that need to be addressed as the design moves from preliminary to final. I think you're on mute, Dave. <laughs> um, so following up on that, um, we know that in, in uh, unlike typical design bid build projects, which are um, design is completed prior to uh, the owner soliciting uh, procurement from the contractors, the design is not complete in a design build project. So as design builders put their team together, including uh, potential design partners, um, there are certain, you know, that the owner provides a performance specification with very de minimis or minimal um, design performed. Typically, they want um, they want X that has uh, A, B, C features. Um, and so during the proposal phase, the various teams have to come up with, in order to price it, they have to come up with some sort of concept of what the owner is looking for and uh, provide some sort of design that the design builder can price. So what is the, and, and then you go, at some point you go from the proposal phase and then with a teaming agreement between everybody into the contract phase, if that team is selected. So what are the expectations that you have from the proposal phase as you move into the contract phase? Um, obviously, you know, I've been involved in some disputes where quantities that were developed for bidding purposes in the proposal phase um, were, I don't want to say erroneous, but um, as more information became available through geotechnical reports or, or whatever additional information design was performed, quantities that were um, used in the proposal phase are no longer valid and can be significantly um, underrun. Um, so what are the expectations as you move from the proposal phase into the contract phase? So, so um, you hit several important points here, Dave, and uh, it comes up all the time in my investigative work. Um, so let's, let's talk, first talk about you know, the RFP documents from the owner. Um, I think that really depends on on the projects and there's no one single answer for, for all the cases. So you have to look at the circumstances for a project. But in general, um, you know, once you receive the RFP, you need to really you know, spend the time to review the RFP very carefully. And um, you know, there are several things that the design build teams, different teams need to you know, be careful uh, about. For example, you know, it's important to make it clear you know, which are you know, binding requirements that have to be complied and um, you know, which information are you know, just, just reference materials. And it's also critical to uh, you know, have in place or, or find out about any protocol that you know, outlines the steps in case questions arise. Um, and if such questions exist, you know, they, have, they should be brought up like early on. So all the parties have to um, you know, uh, communicate to be on the same page. And then with regard to expectations, that's another very important aspect, you know, um, based on the number of disputes that I've seen over the years, sometimes, you know, the expectations from, let's say, the designer and the contractor may not align. Uh, for example, with respect to the level of details and accuracy um, of the initial drawings. Um, and again, this doesn't happen all the time, uh, but at least it does happen and, and worth mentioning. So, you know, so it's important to be fair here and look at both sides of the equations. Um, and um, so I guess one of the key takeaways I want to uh, 
to come forward is, you know, communication is key. You have to, you know, talk to each other to understand what your expectations are and what are the requirements. And again, we have to um, refer back to, you know, what you signed up for in the agreement um, to know what you are expected to deliver. Yeah, and it, 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 um, it, it, you know, I think the inherent discrepancy, I think one could argue that the, you know, when you're looking at a standard of care of the design or the standard of care, um, uh, if, if it's framed in terms of what the ordinary uh, competent designer is responsible for, that it doesn't necessarily, that the standard of care doesn't change uh, but because the design has to be developed during the period, you know, post bid period, um, that uh, the circumstances under which the designer services are being performed change. And I think that, you know, th there are issues that go both ways because inherent in design build uh, types of projects are um, uh, opportunities not only for fast tracking, but to improve efficiencies and costs through uh, getting the constructors uh, uh, assistance on constructability issues, um, potentially realizing, you know, this is why when you look at the, at the RFP and you see the owner's statement of requirements or, or output specifications for the project, that uh, quite often the whole idea behind it is to give the design builder the flexibility and create, create uh, uh, the ability to be creative in achieving efficiencies and, um, and cost savings. And so that comes into value engineering sort, sorts of things. And I think one thing that's critical is to be able to ensure that you build into your process um, the ability for the uh, and obligation for the design, the designer and the constructor to work together to ensure that those um, objectives are accomplished and to uh, potentially avoid uh, uh, problems. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, um, communication is key because you know uh, because the inherent nature of design builds with you know all sorts of uncertainties. Um, you know, we have to. To talk together. So, uh, so for example, you know, uh, with respect to the level of details of uh, of uh, preliminary drawings or ready for estimating drawings, or, or what, whatever you call it, you know, it is this is true uh, that you know the the drawings would not be expected to show you know every single detail. You know, have to call out every single uh, size of the welds or bolts um, in as you know, as detailed as the final uh, uh, drawings. Um, and the documents may still look, um, you know, conceptual in appearance. But as I said, there's a bar that you need to hit for your preliminary design. Um, for example, it would not be reasonable to show an unstable structure or, you know, show non-physical low path. Um, and generally, you know, once you signed up for uh, some, you know, expectations is all requirements um, in the agreements or contracts, you have to, to comply with those. Uh, so be very careful uh, and review the contracts and to know exactly what you, you signed up for. Because as, as Joel mentioned earlier in the contract, there might be instances where the center of care is elevated. Um, so watch out uh, for those cases uh, and you know, look twice before you sign, sign something. Thanks, Don. I know Tom just posted in the chat, but I'm just going to ask, you know, if there are any questions or comments uh, from the audience, so please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and fire away. I guess everybody's busy uh, grabbing their lunch right now, so I'll just move right along. Um, so I know we've talked a little bit uh, about this, but kind of expand more on, on the risks that um, are encountered for the design professional during the proposal phase. Um, and are there ways to, to mitigate those risks, you know, possibly through language in the, um, in the teaming agreement um, where the designer is not held 
particularly when it comes to quantities and such like that, where a designer comes up with a conceptual design, uh, gives the design builder, the contractor, some, some ideas about you know, what types of quantities he may need um, and whether or not the designer can be held to those um, assumptions as they move into the contract phase. Yeah, uh, I I think so, and I think one of the one of the things that's um, quite interesting in the process is that I'm not sure. Uh, quite often, these teaming arrangements are done um, quickly, but it's it's um, you know, in my view, it's important to be able to know what the end game is going to be. So, in other words, because the services that are performed by the design professional at the bidding stage. You know, they may well be being done under a teaming agreement, but they're done in the context that if the design builder is successful in winning the project, that the designer is going to have a fulsome scope of work in an execution contract, and that any of the design services performed at the bidding stage will be wrapped up in the um, execution design services contract. So in my view, it's really critical for the parties to turn their minds, even at the teaming agreement, to the, how the allocation of risk for design um, uh, errors, whether they be, you know, whether the errors resulted from, uh, from the designer's fault or Joe, not. Joe, not to, not to interrupt you, but I would call yeah. it more design assumptions. I think that's the biggest risk because you're still dealing with, you know, maybe a five or ten percent design that the designer is now only bringing to thirty or forty percent, such that the design builder can produce a, an estimate. So it's really, you really can't have errors at that point. To me, it's it's a design based on certain assumptions moving forward. So mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think you should proceed with that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that that's that that that's right. Um, I think that there can be circumstances where um, you know you want your uh, you know whether you're successful or not in your bid, you want your designer to be um, doing a good job up front because that's going to have an impact on whether or not your bid's going to be successful. And at the same time, I think that you're you're quite right. Like from a practical perspective, there needs to be an understanding of the assumptions that that are being made. Um, however, you know the long the long game is such that. Um, you know, eventually, outside of what the owner's requirements are, those some, if you're successful in getting the project, and the designer's doing their work, those assumptions are going to have to go away at some at some point. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. Uh, oh, I, sorry, yeah, I think I, we're just. I want to just kind of move along here. We're getting tight on time. So, for you know, to both of you guys, um, maybe you can elaborate on what you think are some best practices. And maybe some takeaways that uh, we can leave our audience with. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can start this time. Um, so definitely, um, communication is key. You know, as I as I said throughout the, the discussion, you know, it's important to have clear, honest, and, and timely communication between you know the parties involved to ensure you know, everyone is on the same page with regard to expectations and requirements because you know oftentimes you know misaligned expectations could result in some some nasty uh, disputes down the road um, documentation is also important um, you know um, it would be, be good to you know to document you know, all the you know, the changes that that happened or any um, you know information that you think may, might be relevant um, and it's really important to review contracts um, you know, before you sign something and make sure you understand all the terms and conditions included in the contract. And, and if I would, I, and I think just to follow on that from my legal perspective, Todd, that, um, that you know, there's the issue of we were talking, this topic is really the standard of care, but it's hard to necessarily evaluate that um, without also looking at what are the liabilities arising from failing to meet uh, any applicable standard of care. And um, I think, you know, there's a classic conundrum here 
between what uh, the owner is requiring under the design build contract and what the design builder, the level of risk and liability that the design builder is able to pass along to the designer. There's always insurance that can be looked at to help fill any applicable gaps, but frequently there's a, a conundrum arising from the fact that the, the, um, the designer uh, you know, the designer's fees on the project are typically, you know, uh, uh, much, much less, you know, they may only be 5% of the overall construction costs. So uh, the classic conundrum is what is the designer prepared to put on the table in terms of risk, recognizing that the, the entire context of the design and build agreement is typically much more uh, heavy in terms of risk transfer from the owner to the design builder than you would typically find in a, uh, a traditional construction contract. The projects are typically bigger, more complex, uh, often public projects. Uh, you can see it on, on uh, pu public private partnerships, especially. And so, uh, you know, with things like performance guarantees, um, uh, with associated liquidated damages, liquidated damages for delay and the like, um, I think the parties really have to turn their minds seriously as to how much risk is able to be able to trans to be transferred to the design consultant, and you know at the end of the day, um, how to address the risk of um, liabilities that cannot be by by contract or by insurance. Thanks, Joel. Don, do you have anything else? Um, yeah, sure. So I think risk mitigation is 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 really important, uh, and you can do you know do it early and as uh, as you can you know when you start a project when you you uh, form a team you draft a contract you know always make sure to have like the plan how to mitigate risk. Um, you know, don't wait too long until you know the problem you know blows up and all the damages are um, you know large. Um, because you know that might be might be too late. Uh, so there there are ways to you know um, control the risks and um, you know avoid uh, you know all these issues early on as as early as you can. But once you know in the unfortunate situations when you know happens to arise, you know there are you know ways we can can do to to help mitigate that. And uh, I, I run into this a lot um, in my um, my investigations. You know like. Um, you know, we can go in and try to, you know, find, find out the cause of the, all the, you know, the, uh, the issues and help you, you uh, resolve it. But, you know, my advice is, you know, think about risk mitigation early on. Terrific. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you. Um, I see in the chat that there's been a lot of side discussion going on. I think it, it looked pretty interesting, um, which is great. Um, and I note uh, that Tom has just posted that our next toolbox talk is going to be on December 8th. It's going to be uh, attorney fee shifting clauses and strategies. So unless there are any other questions, I'd just like to thank everybody for their time this afternoon or this morning, depending. Um, other than that, uh, have a good day. Thank Tom, you, do you everyone. have anything else? No, great job. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I know it's a pretty short discussion. Uh, and I know we can talk about this for hours. So if you have any questions that you really want to, uh, to, to, to ask, you know, feel free to reach out to me or Joel or Dave or Tom um, you know, privately. We're happy to, um, to have follow-up discussions with you. Have a great yeah. afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. I hope to see you all around, maybe in Puerto Rico. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.